guys on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Doug Lucas and it's good to be with you on back-to-back -back nights. We had clarity last night and again tonight. Last night we worked on the Caldwell objects. We did the eighth in our series of that study and tonight we're coming back to the Herschel 400 list. Once again it's our eighth uh, installment of this series as well. We're so glad you're here with us. Uh, as you can see we're using a, um, a Rasa 11 I think you can see it, uh, let's see which way, over here uh, to the right of me, you can see the Ross 11. It's already pointing at NGC 6866, so let's change our title to that. NGC 6886, 6866, and this is an open cluster in the constellation Cygnus. The swan, whoop, an open cluster in the constellation Cygnus, the swan, Cygnus, swan. All right, and um, I think um, we're going to go back to our scope view here. Um, here's our sky cam. You can see a, a few clouds over there the left. It looks like a an airplane flying across, photobombing our view there. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go back to our screen view and uh, get a look at this open cluster. It's uh, a rich little cluster, and we're taking a lot of our descriptions tonight from Stephen James O'Meara's book, The Herschel 400 Observing Guide. And uh, in his book, he does say something about NGC 6866. He says it's a marvelous open cluster about three and a half degrees east-southeast of third magnitude Delta Cygni. Uh, he says Caroline Herschel discovered it on the evening of July 23rd, 1783. And uh, he basically says the smallest of telescopes will show the cluster as a partially resolved spine of stars. Um, See if we can see the spine. I guess so. Um, it's a marvel in telescopes of all size. You know, these open clusters sometimes are um, are not as brilliant as we would like for them to be. But here's the spine he's talking about. See that spine down the middle there. And uh, I would say this is a, a fairly interesting open cluster. Kind of reminds me of salt and pepper. Let's uh, go over here and do a, um, an, uh, an entry. Let's see, do we have a... Um, what happened to my... Uh, what happened to our... I'm just going to... I tell you what, I don't know what happened to this. It looks like we planted some new um, lines on here, doesn't it? Um, let's go back and center on 6866 again. And uh, these red lines I don't normally have, but there, there's where the scope is. You can see that cluster right there in the middle of the frame. Yeah, I'm just going to check and make sure the um, the uh, live stream is doing okay. Uh, let's see, you're going to just, um, here we go, make sure the audio is there. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Peer Tech, good to have you here, Vito. And uh, Dane, good to have you back. Uh, John from Magdalena, New Mexico. It's great to have you here tonight, John. How do I say your last name? Labrec, Labre, Labrec, Labrec, something like that. John, good to have you here. Etienne from uh, Uberdo, Quebec. Good to have you here. And some other folks from Vermont. Uh, good to have you guys on board in a rather impromptu session. We just called this um, not too long ago when we saw that the sky would be clear tonight. Okay, while we're here, we need to get this menu back, don't we? Uh, let's see, observing sessions. And this will be um, 
Herschel 400, the Herschel 400 part 8, and it's observing session 80. So let's make a new one, and let's say 0080, the Herschel 400 part 8. And uh, we'll just uh, put it somewhere toward uh, on the 18th, maybe around 2 something a.m., and um, so there's our observing session. Now we can associate it with, a, with the um, observing list and um, pick out the observing session. Let's see, there we go. And uh, then we can say um, this, let's go back to our live view. This rather loose uh, cluster would not have stood out to us had Caroline Herschel not discovered it. Okay, this is our first time to observe this cluster. So it's great to have you guys aboard. Uh, Labrec, John says, nice and easy. Uh, good to have you guys aboard. Thanks for being with us tonight. So I'll just uh, do a quick snapshot of this cluster, just so we have a record of it. Uh, like I say, it's it's probably not the kind of thing that would have attracted us. But then again, the Herschel 400 is full of objects that are maybe more challenging, and we wouldn't have spotted it on our own. Uh, but uh, Caroline Herschel, thank goodness she did. All right, so now we can go back to our planetarium software. And in our Herschel 400 working list, let's, um, let's go back and find this is object 6866 again. You know, come to think of it, I did not put NGC 6866. I'm going to do another snapshot of that so it'll be properly named. Now, back in our planetarium software, here's 6866. Let's add that to the Herschel 400 observed. And another thing we'll do is we'll go up here to Live Sky. And in, this is, of course, uh, Simulation curriculums, a SimCurs, um, a cloud-based version of all of your your observing lists and all. So we use it to actually do the deleting because it has that capability and Starry Night Pro doesn't. So we're working on Herschel 400 working list right here, and what we're going to do is edit that. And then here we're going to say 6866, and there it is, NGC 6866. We're going to delete it from the working list and then save it. We added it to the observe list, okay? So now let's go to NGC 6834. How about that? And we'll let you see the scope there and center it and also open up the information panel. So this is another open cluster, and it's in the constellation Cygnus also. It is NGC 6834. So let's go down to our title and just change those last two, 6834. Okay, so here is what we're looking for. Looks like another kind of spine there, 6834. Uh, let's back down to auto again and do another plate solve, but I can see it right there in the middle. Look at that spine. While it's uh, plate solving, let's find it in our index. Let's see. 68.34. It's on page 254. 254. We're in September, but I guess it's not surprising, huh? Because we're over halfway through August. Uh, it's a small and relatively dim open star cluster midway between and a little northeast of a line between fifth magnitude 15 volpeculi 
and fifth magnitude phi Cygni. Look for a dim haze centered on a little line of 10th and 11th magnitude stars. See, there's the, uh, the line of 10th and 11th magnitude stars, and here's the dim haze. Okay, so we did our plate solving, and I don't think we need to stack this. But there's that dim haze, so we're at about 100, there's 100% 100 of our optical zoom. There's the line of 10th and 11th magnitude stars, and here's that dim haze. Again, not a particularly rich cluster, um, but it certainly is worthy of being in the Herschel 400. We will do a, um, add a log, log entry to this, and uh, notice it kept our uh, observing list and also the uh, observing session. And let's read just a little bit more here. It um, is a small elliptical glow centered on that line. Looks like a faint background glow. Uh -huh. um, with the vertical vision, the line is surrounded by a rich assortment of finely resolved stars. Let's stack this just a little bit, just so we can catch that glow. So we're going to go up here and change our uh, sequence to start imaging. And what that'll do is it'll start the live stacking process, give us 20 second exposures. And by the way, if you are with us tonight, and would you and you'd like to uh, tell us where you're observing from, we'd love to to hear from you. We've got Vito out of uh, near Chicago. We've got Dane, and Dane, I think you're from what Minnesota? I forget. John from Magdalena, New Mexico. Etienne from up in Quebec. And uh, some other folks from Vermont. Great to have you guys here. So, with this um, live stacking now, let's um, put the sky glow right about there and then bring the mids up a bit. And that does reveal a lot more of the cluster, doesn't it? Take a look at that now. It's a little bit more rich now, isn't it? Minnesota, yes, Dane. A little bit more rich. How about that? Well, that's 100% of our optical. You can uh, enlarge that a little bit and let's go a little bit into our digital, just so you, digital zoom, just so you can see more of the structure. Here's this line of stars and 6834, make sure I'm on the right one, yeah. The cluster is odd. A sinuous line of five prominent suns splits the center. See, can you see those five prominent suns? See if you can count them. With the vertivision, that line is surrounded by a rich assortment of finely resolved stars. The cluster also swells with the vertivision and has north and south extensions like wings that flow out from the center of the line. The cluster is very rich having 138 members in a disk six arc minutes across, the stars shine 11th magnitude and fainter. That's just beautiful, isn't it? Look at that. So here are those five suns. And look at these wings. I, I see what he means now that he describes these. So we're going to put in our little observing window here. We're going to say five stars in a spine of 10th and 11th magnitude brightness uh, with wings on each side as Steve O'Meara wrote. Tell you what, Stephen James O'Meara does give us a bit of a, of a better description sometimes, doesn't he? He just has a way, I think it's just all that experience 6834, and we'll save this as seen. Azrae, good to have you back. Uh, Vito, it is beautiful. Uh, thanks for that encouragement. Um, it's a beautiful night out there, really, really clear. Um, okay, so we've saved. Now let's go back over to our planetarium software and add this to our Herschel 400 observed. This is NGC 6834, so let's come back here. 
We're still in edit mode, so we'll just say 6834. There it is, delete, delete, and save. We were thinking about doing the Caldwell list again tonight, but you know, when we got the Caldwell list out and uh, looked at what was available, uh, there were only one or two stars that were that we hadn't already observed in this time of year. So we'll have to wait till another night and catch a few, a few more of those. Laura, you are on from Kentucky. Is this the Laura that I know? Uh, and Jen, good to have you on from Atlanta. Jen, you usually have some kind of refreshments for everyone, if I remember right. Laura, it's great to have you. If you're the Laura that I think I know, it's great to have you aboard. Um, all right, our next object here in terms of height, sheer height, is NGC 6910. So let's slew to that and we'll also um, center on it in our planetarium software and open up the little observing pane. This is another open cluster. It's open cluster night. Here at Emerald Hill Skies, it's open cluster night. Uh, Jen says no, that's Donna. Oh yes, you're right. Donna's the one who brings the refreshments. Jen, you have a good memory. Uh, Laura, it's great to have you here. Uh, I don't know what, what we did to deserve this for you to stop by, but we're, we're just honored that you chose to stop in. Uh, well, this looks like a rich part of the Milky Way. Um, take a look here at the part of the Milky Way we're reviewing. This is just incredibly filled with stars. And in the middle of this, we're going to see, oh wow, look at this. We're not only going to see this cluster, but what is all this nebulosity behind it? I am eager to see this. Uh, the cluster itself is 6910. So let's change our title. 6910. And this cluster is in um, also in Cygnus, so that still works down there. Let's come back to the screen. Wow, what is all this? Is that the... Um, a lot going on, isn't it? What is all this nebula here, man? I'm tempted to say maybe that's like the heart and the soul nebula or something like that, but but I'll maybe we'll read this description and find out in a second. Um, no, not much about it. Boy, it's a beautiful part of the sky, though. Look, this is real close to Seder, this incredibly bright star, Seder. Well, this is going to be really interesting. Let's do a plate solve. Um, we did slew there. Look at that cluster right in the middle. I'm pretty sure that's the cluster we wanted to find, but let's do a plate solve. Yeah, there's Seder, I bet. Hmm, and this is 6910. Let's change our name up here while we're at it. NGC 6910. We're using SharpCap as our uh, imaging software. SharpCap is a unique kind of imaging software that lets you observe real time. Uh, it stacks the images if you want to do that. Looks like we were only uh, eight hundredths of a degree off, yeah. So we were pointed roughly in the right spot, but there you see the telescope make an eight hundredths of a degree correction, and now we'll be that much more accurate for the next object. I always feel smarter and more blessed peeking in here. <laughs> Laura, you're uh, you're awesome to encourage. Well, we feel honored to have you. Mike, hello from Georgia. Good to have you aboard again. Yeah, I think you were with us last night as well. Very kind of you to stop in. So this is a cluster that we're looking at here. 6910. Uh, let's go ahead and stack just a little bit in hopes of seeing some of that uh, nebulosity. And while that's stacking, Let's find this cluster in um, Steve O'Meara's book. 6910 is on page 260. And it says it's a moderately small but crisp little cluster, just 30 minutes north northeast of Gamma Cygni, a very nice aggregation of pretty suns. Steve O'Meara. He says, uh, it's a very delicate cluster with two bright seventh magnitude gems. So you see those. There are the two seventh magnitude stars. 
amidst an elongated spread of sharp stars. There they are. At 72 power, the spread of stars comprises a sinuous stream of sparkling stars of similar magnitude that flow like water past the brighter stars superimposed on it. Okay, so flow like water. He must have been out by the beach that night. There are some 66 stars here of 9.6 magnitude and fainter. He says it's a marvelous open cluster. Uh, Caroline Husher, Herschel discovered this one too. Oh wait, that's back on 6866. So that's all we have on 6910. It's um, 66 stars. Now that's kind of cool that he counted these up for us, isn't it? So we'll do a, um, a log entry here and we'll say 66 stars according to James, to Steve O'Meara. Um, we could easily make out the two seventh magnitude, but we had to work harder to see all the background nebulosity in this region. Something like that will say NGC 6910. Papa Tech, good evening, just dropped in for a moment, had family over for my birthday today and need rest now. Great to see somebody has clear skies. Papa Tech, Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Papa Tech, happy birthday to you. Stu, good to have you on from New Zealand, a filthy, wet, cold winter's day here. Wow. Stu, so sorry to hear that. Jen wished uh, Papa Tech happy birthday. Don's, Don, good to have you on, Cornstorm, um, welcome. And... Yeah, I think, Stu, it might be the third time, but the first one was a wash. I think we got one star in through a hole in the clouds, you might recall. Last night was a little better. Laura wished Papa Tech happy birthday as well. Uh, that's very kind of you to thank for the song. I'm not going to quit my day job. Uh, Don is asking everybody to like this stream. Don, we're going to have to send you some kind of thank you note. I'm still interested in seeing all this background nebulosity here. Let's, let's kind of back off and see if we can still, oh yeah, we're starting to pick that up now, aren't we? Look at all that. Now I'm interested in seeing, what is this nebula called here? Uh, you would think that they would tell us that in our planetarium software, wouldn't you? Huh. So there's the, there's the cluster. What is this big nebula, and why is it unnamed? Are you kidding me? This, this thing is not named. It, it just says Diffuse Nebula, LBN270. There you go, LBN270. We're going to go up here and just do a quick LBN270 wiki, something like that. Um, nope, it doesn't have its own Wikipedia article. LBN270 is the large region of nebulosity north of Seder. The date given, hmm, is a dim nebula, five out of a one to six scale, located in Cygnus. Yeah, that's it, all right. <clears throat> it's, um, the exact location is elusive. Oh, I didn't think it's very elusive. Uh, most of the nebulosity has been cataloged by Dickel, Windker, and Boritz, DWB, catalog of various uh, hydrogen alpha regions located in the Cygnus 10 region was published in 1969. Kind of a nondescript bunch of nebulosity, huh? Well, in any event, we're going to go ahead and uh, say that we are looking at 6910. <clears throat> We're going to delete that from the working list now and save. And then here in 6910 in our planetarium software, we're going to say add to observing list the Herschel 400 observed. <clears throat> Let's go back over to our live view. This is live now through our uh, 
ZWO ASI 2600MC Pro camera. And really, this is the cluster we came to see. With those two seventh magnitude stars. <clears throat> Let's take a picture of this. Uh, let's see. Papatech, appreciate that Ethernet. Yep. Etienne, autocorrect. Oh, I appreciate that, Etienne. <laughs> so Papatech's uh, autocorrect changed his word Etienne to Ethernet. Don, do you think you'll see any of that in the picture you're taking? Yes, I think we're, we're definitely seeing it. Look at all that nebulosity. That'll definitely show up. Uh, Jen, how do, how do they use the word magnitude in defining stars, or what does that mean, I should ask? Laura, hope you have a good sleep. Uh, Jen, the, the story of magnitude goes back a long ways, and it was the first amateur astronomer's attempt to catalog the stars that they could see with the naked eye in the night sky. And they did a magnitude, I think, in the beginning of 1 through 6 or something, with 6 being the dimmest they could see and 1 being the brightest. But uh, that was pre-instruments. Uh, that was just naked eye listings. They were making it with their naked eye guessing, trying to compare. Once we got instruments, and in particular, boy, I'm not going to remember the name. Is it spectrometer? No the instrument that measures the luminance of stars, we discovered that really they were off a little bit on the relative brightness. So the whole thing was rewritten. Now we have stars that go down to like, what? Help me out, guys. Help me remember, is it minus seven or something? We have stars that go all the way as high up as you want to go. I think our uh, Rasa can see stars of 18th magnitude and beyond. Uh, of course, there's no limit to what telescopes like the James Webb can see in terms of magnitude. So the whole magnitude scale is a little bit weird, but it was meant to be that a first magnitude star was supposed to be, I think if I remember right, what, twice as bright as a second, and second was supposed to be twice as bright as a third. Anyway, it's that kind of a scale that was done by amateurs before their instruments. And so really, to be honest now, you just kind of have to go by what the uh, star is ranked in terms of the equipment that's measured its luminance. And uh, those are all available in star uh, charts like this one we're using. Every one of these stars is cataloged and you can uh, look at the info on it and it'll tell you what magnitude it is like this one which is Hipparchus 100542 has been um, measured at 8.5 Five zero, so to the hundredth, it's been measured now, and they've got these magnitudes now lined up all carefully, um, you know, uh, ranked. So that's kind of a little bit about magnitude, the best of my memory. Yeah, and that's true. As Ray's right, the the larger the number is, then that means it's getting fainter and fainter. So a, a first magnitude star was the brightest that they could originally see. All right, so let's uh, take one last picture of this since we've got a little more of that nebulosity here now. And look at Seder. Isn't that an amazing star? Um, let's go back to our um, three-second images here. And let's see, we already did all of our... Um, yeah, I think we already did all of our... book work here, right? Yeah. So we're ready for now NGC 6802. NGC 6802. So that's slew there. And uh, we'll also center on it and show the info panel. It's another open cluster. This is definitely open cluster night, guys. And This one probably is over in uh, Volpecula, the fox. So this is 6802. Let's go down to our title and change this to 6802, an open cluster in Volpecula. 
the fox. And before I forget, let's go here. Let's do one more plate solve. 6802. NGC 6802. And um, Jen says that's interesting. NTN says you have a great memory. Yeah, but we'll have to look it up to verify I me. Mean, uh, Jen says, that's good to know. Azrae, glad to see you have a clear night tonight. We're cloudy. You're so sorry, Azrae. I think you're in Arizona. Sorry to hear that. But do appreciate you being with us here tonight. Uh, so we were off uh, 0.16 degrees. I think that's worth uh, plate solving. As soon as this settles down from that little movement, yes, Arizona. Um... I guess it's settled down. Now we can go to our start imaging. Look at those two sets of double stars there. That's interesting. Okay, so this is uh, 6802. Let's go back in our NGC 6802. That's on 252. And it says, it's a small and somewhat dim open cluster immediately east of 6.5 magnitude Volpe 7 Volpeculi, the easternmost star in the famous coat hanger asterism. Huh, how about that? Uh, under a dark sky, the cluster is a small puff of light that will vanish with any light pollution. How about that? Well, we're going to hope that it won't vanish tonight. Let's do another... Look at that. So there's that star that is in that coat hanger asterism. Um, let's go look at that real quick just so you can see it. Sometimes it's so hard to get back to our... So help us find this coat hanger asterism. Ah, here it is. Um, kind of difficult to see when we've got this many stars dialed up. But that coat hanger asterism is right here. There's just a lot going on there that makes it difficult to see, isn't it? Okay, here it is. I think that's the top of the hanger, isn't it? And then it unfolds. Yeah, we're looking at it upside down, so that's another reason why it's going to be difficult to see. But anyway, um, here's that <clears throat> cluster. It doesn't really show very many stars in the cluster here in uh, Starry Night Pro, does it? Looks like just um, four, eight stars. But then when we widen back out, there's some nebulosity here and a little bit more of that puff of light. Let's see if we can start seeing that puff of light at some point. We're at uh, 2 minutes and 20 seconds. Boy, that is a beautiful little cluster. Look how it's got lots of green and orange stars. Wow. Now this one stands out to me a little more. This one is kind of unique. Let's see what Stephen James O'Meara says. 6802. Um, simply a dim circular glow of uniformly faint light in a 4-inch. In a 72 power, it's a 5 arc minute wide cluster that's extremely elongated north to south. Okay. Uh, although the cluster's brightest stars shine at 14th magnitude, some members or clumps of them can be resolved. The cluster also breaks down into three segments. The little triangular core which is bordered to the north and south by opposing triangles. What? The little triangular core. Is this the triangular core? There, that must be the triangle. 
that. And then here is the, the one where I can see it now, Steve O'Meara. Somewhere here, there's the triangle. Maybe that's it. There's the triangle. And he saw this visually because, look, that star that he thinks is a triangle is actually three stars. And this star, which he thought was a triangle, is three stars. He thought was a pinpoint, is actually three stars. So this triangle is made up of two points that have triple stars in them. But he saw that as a triangle. And then, see, here's the north triangle, and there's the south triangle. It does, doesn't it? It looks like angel wings or something. Now, see, I would have never noticed that without Steve O'Meara's help. Um, making the overall appearance a cluster similar to that of a little bow tie. Jen, sorry that you had to go. Oh, maybe Papa Tech went, so you're still there, Jen. Yeah, Jen, I, I agree, all those colors. Uh, Jen says she sees the fox. Well, that's awesome. I don't know if I saw the fox. Uh, you know, Steve O'Meara was using, I can't remember for sure what he uses. Um, I think it's a four-inch telescope, and he switches eyepieces. He switches it from the 23 power to the 72 power. And I think part of the reason why he does that is just to prove that you can see the Herschel 400 list with a four-inch telescope. But I think generally accepted you, it's accepted you have to have a six-inch telescope. It's just if you're Steve O'Meara, you can see it with four-inch. It doesn't really say how many members here. Remember how he was into the counting on the other ones? Very interesting. A little bow tie. So let's go over and do our um, log entry here. So um, after Steve O'Meara, it's interesting that sometimes Starry Night Pro has this little bug to start over. After, yeah, we're going to have to start over again. <laughs> Simulation curriculum, I don't ever curse your name. Uh, after, because I'm not someone who curses, but boy, if I were someone who cursed. After, here we go. After Steve O'Meara, Steve, I'm going to love typing once I learn how to do it. After Steve O'Meara pointed it out, we could see the little triangle in the center. With a north triangle and south triangle as wings, like a bow tie. Uh, but what also struck us was all the colors, um, oranges, greens, and more. Now, I don't know if some of that is because of our color, maybe our color matching that we have. Let's back off the green a little bit because, you know, all these colors are relative. And maybe back off the orange. Now there are lots of blues. <laughs> all these colors are relative, aren't they? Because it really boils down to what you see in the sky. But man, no matter how you slice it, there are lots of different colors there, aren't there? I'm not very good at colors. What do you guys see? Looks good with your software. Stellarium does not do it justice. Uh, that's very kind of you to say, Azrae. We love Starry Night Pro uh, Plus. P. Lark, Pooh Bear does the best presentations. <laughs> You're a rascal, P. Lark. Don, that cluster crusting covers a wide range of solar types. Love that color display. Jen says, I wonder if those ink blots come from space. I think you're right. And I noticed you put the little upside down emoji smile. I think you're right. Uh, this little bow tie thing is here, isn't it? Boy, and you saw a fox here, huh, Jen? Wow, I got to say, that's, that's something I didn't see. Well, we're going to take a uh, snap a picture of this. Uh, this was a unique cluster. We kind of got into this one, didn't we, gang? 6802. So 
We're going to add that to the observing list. H400 observed. We're going to go to Live Sky. We're going to look for 6802. Delete it from the working. Save. Now we're going to go to 6830. 6830. Center on that. Open up the little info pane. It's another open cluster. Woohoo! <laughs> it is open cluster night for sure. And this one is in Volpecula also. 6830. 6830. 6830. NGC 6830. Not 2030. And let's stop our sequencer. So there's the next part of the sky. This one I would have just glossed over. Look at that cluster there. Okay, so I'm going to say Stephen James O'Meara is going to talk about the intersecting line of four stars, intersecting this line of four stars, and connected here. So it's like a little arrow. I bet that's what he's going to say. What do you guys think? Uh, we're going to say start imaging, and this is 6830. So let's find this guy, 6830. 6830 is on 252. Uh, it's a small but very nice open cluster near 5th magnitude 12 Vulpeculi, the western tip of the boot of Vulpeculi. Under a dark sky, in a three-degree field of view, the cluster shares the celestial stage with M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Look for a tiny tr tangle of suns immersed in a web of unresolved light. It is a small but rich cluster that is best appreciated with low power in a small telescope. At 23 power, it's a pretty little cluster with bright triangular core. He's really into triangles, isn't he? What do you think he's seeing here? This triangle, maybe? I bet he's seeing that triangle there. He says a bright triangular core. Um, the core is surrounded by five minutes, five arc minute wide halo of dim suns. Yeah. Uh, the cluster also appears wedged between two ninth magnitude stars. At 72 power, it looks like a cross with bent arms. Yeah. You can see that, can't you? A cross with bent arms. A splash of bright stars lies at the cluster's core. Mm -hmm. With averted vision, these suns mingle with a multitude of well-resolved fainter stars that seem to fade away in layers. Okay. The cluster has some 82 stars of 10th magnitude fainter. 82 stars. And he says, don't move the scope very much because you can see another cluster very close by. Well, I kind of like this. i tell you what let's do. Let's do a... Um, a screen capture of this. Well, I don't know where the cluster ends. Do you guys? Is this whole thing the cluster? That's what we're going to guess. And we're going to call this in desktop sharp cap captures. We're going to call this NGC 6830. Uh, at two minutes, which is almost nothing, uh, eight frames on 2022 
zero eight um, seventeen. That'll make a nice little a nice little snapshot of that, huh? But we'll also save a, exactly a scene down here. It's hard to tell where that cluster stops. I wonder if there's another cluster like out here somewhere, you think? Could be. Let's see what the other one that he wants us to look at. 6823. Hmm. 6823. So 68, oh, 6830. We've observed that, and then we're going to 6830, and delete that, and save. Now 6823, hmm, I wonder if we've already observed that, maybe. I guess we could alphabetize these by name real quick, couldn't we? Sixty-eight, sixty-eight, twenty-three. Boy, there are a lot of objects yet to see here, aren't there? Sixty-eight. Well, we've evidently already observed sixty-eight, twenty-three. It's already off our list. Okay, now we got our altitude. 30. Okay, let me see what you guys have been saying here. Um, I thought the bow tie were the ears of a fox. <laughs> I wonder, Jen, if that's what you were seeing. No, the fox was much bigger. Azray, have you started to post your pictures in Astrobin? You know, I haven't gotten that done yet. It may help you with the subscriptions. Boy, I'm so happy with the 3,800 subscribers already, but yeah, I don't mind doing that. It's an umbrella, Don says. That's a good idea, Don. I think you're right. You're onto something there. The little arrow that I saw, it looks more like an umbrella. Let's go back to it and see what Don's saying. I get it. See, here's the top of the umbrella. And there's the thing you hold on to. And there's even a little handle there. You are so onto that. I think we're going to have to use your name, Don. This is the Umbrella Ghost Cluster. Or it looks like a cross, as Ray says. It is all isosceles to dawn. Three degrees is huge. The moon is only about a half degree, right? Uh, degrees, Jen asks, you know, Jen, what we do is we divide up the visible sky into 180 degrees, like half of a circle. And then each of those degrees is divided up into arc minutes, uh, 360 of them. And then each arc minute is divided up into arc seconds, again, um, Wait, sorry, 180 degrees, 60 arc minutes in each degree, 60 arc seconds in each minute. So that's kind of the way you, you describe things. You, you say, like, this is five arc minutes wide. It means it's five of those minutes, which were 1 60th of a degree each. Hope that helps. Uh, let's uh, stop stacking now. Did we do a picture of this? Uh, let's do one just in case. And then we'll go back to next target. Yep, it's all related to marine navigation, correct. Um, so we're going to go back here, 6882. 6882. You know what? I didn't say. Um, this looked like an umbrella to Don. He had a great point. Um, beautiful little cross. So that's 6830. Now we're looking 6882 is another open cluster. <laughs> 
It is also in Vulpecula. 6882. Let's go here and change 6882. Um, 6882. All right, let's go back out to 100%. Hmm. You know, um, sometimes on these on these things that <coughs> excuse me don't really stand out. It helps to use the um, um, image annotation tool, uh, which Robin Glover has now programmed into SharpCat. Extremely helpful. We were about uh, three hundredths of a degree off, so not a lot, but I think we'll see. There's that three hundredth of a degree correction being made. Uh, so now we're looking at exactly, look at this line here. Isn't this fascinating? Look at that line of stars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, at least fifteen line, fifteen stars in a little line there. It's like they were, they were on their way like a bunch of ants to go, I bet this is that cluster, what do you think? So what we'll do is we'll go up here under Tools, and we'll say Deep Sky Image Annotation, and sure enough, it'll try to identify things. Now in this case, it's just identifying stars. And look how it's off a little bit from the original, um, the original um, charting we were doing. But it does help us see 18 Volpecula, 19 Volpecula, and 20 Volpecula. So now let's turn that off. And I bet this is our cluster here. I doubt if we need to stack this, but we'll do it just because we can. How about that? And this is, uh, sure enough, 6882. So let's find 6882. I don't know if this is a very efficient way to do this, to, to look at them in our Starry Night Pro list and then find them in the book. I think it's better to just do the book, don't you guys think? 6882, 255, yeah, because that's where we've been anyway. 255, 6882. Oh, yeah, 6885 and 6882 are together in the same frame. Okay, so we can do both of these. NGC 6885 is a 2-in-1 cluster. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, William Herschel first discovered NGC 6885 on September 9th, 1784. The next night he discovered 6882. But Harold G. Corwin, Infrared Processing Analysis Center, believes William Herschel saw the same cluster on both nights. <laughs> Oops. Herschel made a 15-minute positional error in his second observation, which led to the belief and confusion that two clusters exist. Ruh-roh. But only one does, NGC 6885. So the Herschel 400 is really... No, surely not. Yes, it is. The Herschel 400 is really... The Herschel 399. <laughs> oh no! My entire life is ruined. Therefore, by making observation of NGC 6085, you also make an observation of NGC 6882. Under a dark sky, the cluster is large and scattered, but its stars are quite apparent, being huddled around 6 magnitude 20 volpeculi. Volpeculi. And remember, Here is 20 Volpeculi. So it's off a little bit from its annotation, but that is the star that the cluster is huddled around. Hmm. It looks like a massive cluster that's been shredded by tidal forces. The brightest and most obvious sections are an east-west oriented spit of starlight. Okay. Um, 
six minutes northwest of 20 Vulpeculi, and a trapezoid of starlight just southwest of At 72 power, a line of equally spaced 11th and 12th magnitude sun slices through the spit of starlight. So what is the trapezoid he's seeing? Is it this? That must be the trapezoid, these four stars. And then on the other side, he saw... A spit of starlight. Oh, would that be this? Is that a spit? Boy, I'm not. Uh, I'm not as enthralled with this description. Um, through the spit of starlight, uh, we also see stars scintillating with fainter suns. I guess those are these fainter suns. The cluster contains only 60 members to 13th magnitude, the brightest of which shine around 6th. Well, there you go. That's uh, NGC 6882 for you. And he said it has uh, 60 members. So we're going to do a, a log entry here, and we're going to say 60 members. Um, interesting that Herschel apparently made a mistake and identified or, quote, discovered this cluster on two consecutive evenings, naming it with two names. 6882 and 6885. So it's just been 6882. We're going to open up 6885 and see if they give us a different information pane. They do. I wrote on uh, April 19th this past spring, we love the color differences between the 19 and 20 Volpecula look like Christmas lights on this crisp 34 degree morning. In September of 2021, I wrote, we saw 19 Volpecula as super yellow and 20 Volpecula as the center of NGC 6085, beautiful open cluster object. How about that? So tonight, we're gonna say, The same observation that we wrote for 6882. <laughs> this is two for one special. How about that? What have you guys said? Um, Don says, talking about degrees, sextant, astro label. We are spoiled with GPS now. Jen says, I get lost with GPS. <laughs> Crying hippie, why are you not checking out the bright planet beside the moon? Ah, Uranus you're talking about. It's because we're on this uh, Herschel 400 list. Uh, what is that planet? I've been wondering about that. Jupiter? Nope. It would be fun to see Jupiter or Saturn with that telescope. Okay, just check. Mars is nearest the moon tonight. Oh, no. Got to retitle all the videos. <laughs> oh, you guys. Anyway, we're done with this. Let's do a quick little save exactly a scene. And... We're going to go here to 6882 and say we observed it, and 6885, and say we observed it. We're going to go to Live Sky, and we're going to go 6882 and remove it. And then we're going to remove 6885, which is really crazy. and then save. Okay, so these two are done.
I'm going to check those, see if they remain checked. And then look here at Mars. Not currently visible from your location. Yeah, I don't think that's Mars. I don't know what... Um, let's go look at the moon. The moon's not currently visible. So where we are, it's not up yet. Um, but maybe, I think the moon rises at any minute now, right? Let's go back to the moon. Open up the uh, information panel. It rises tonight on August 17th. Oh, look, we're in 2023. That's odd, isn't it? There's 2022. It rises tonight at um, 11.50 p.m. here in Eastern Time. So we've got about 20 minutes before it comes up. Um, I wonder if we could... Hide the horizon for a moment. Just to go look at it and we'll see what you guys are seeing next to it. So there's the moon and Uranus is closest. Mars is out here so it's it's pretty far away. Let's see what that angular distance is. Angular separation between Mars and the moon is about 14 degrees. So that's pretty far, but that's like a fist and a half away. Boy, that's a beautiful little cluster, isn't it? All right, back on track here. Uh, let's uh, go to next target. Stu says, for me, Saturn is near the rising moon. Yeah, probably true. All right, now let's go here. Uh, to um, list again and Herschel 400 working list. Did we decide that it's better to use the book? What do you guys think? You've got good eyes to see Uranus next to the moon. You know, the when it rises, we'll go look at it. How about that? The Rasa 11 does really well with Uranus. You guys will love it. Um, Let's go back to July. The trouble is, I don't know which one of these we've seen already. For instance, NG 6287. Um, sixty-two eighty-seven. Oh, it's not. So let's go there. GC 6287. Oh, this is a globular cluster. At least we're going to get to see something different tonight. You know, last night we had a really nice mix of objects in the Caldwell List segment we were in. We, <clears throat> we were looking at... Um, we saw last night, remind me, a planetary nebula, a spiral galaxy, an open cluster, a couple of open clusters, a couple of globular clusters, uh, an irregular galaxy. I mean, we saw a really nice mix of things last night, didn't we? Tonight, we've seen lots of open clusters. So thanks, you guys, for helping us enjoy those no matter what. 6287, it's a globular cluster in Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus. So we're going to go down here in the title and say 6287 NGC 6287 a globular cluster in Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus. 
NGC 6287. NGC 6287. And Stephen James O'Meara writes that it is a moderately small and dim globular cluster, a little more than two degrees north and slightly east of NGC 6284. In a small telescope, it's a round comet like glow that could be washed out from suburban locations at 23 power and a 4 inch. In a dark sky, it's round comet like glow, three arc minutes in diameter. Averted vision is needed to see it well. Much better at 72 power, appearing as a uniformly bright circular glow with some modeling suspected on averted vision. With concentration, a diffuse, unresolved core can be seen. Sixty-two eighty-seven. Ah, look, look right there in the middle. You can already see it really faint there, can't you? So let's switch our sequencer on to start imaging. And at 20 seconds, we're going to see that uh, globular cluster. <clears throat> uh, I like using Omira's book. Yeah, I think you're right, Mike. I think that's the best way. I think it's more organized. You move um, in smaller patches. Because using this approach that we were using in Starry Night Pro, uh, it's just focused on um, height above the horizon. And so it can move in several parts of the night sky. I, I think Stephen James O'Meara's book is a better approach. Boy, look at our... Um, color balancing starting to get messed up. I don't know if that's because the moon is near nearly nearly rising or if this is in a part of the sky that's affected by the um, sky glow. Let's see. We got rid of our horizon, didn't we, because of the horizon is here. Yeah, that's what it is. This is southwest. So that's right at the suburbs of Louisville. And it's very low on the horizon. It's only... Um, boy, I've lost it now. 60 Here it is. 19 degrees above the horizon. So we're starting to lose this. Let's, let's go ahead and catch it real quick. Boy, it is tiny, isn't it? Uh, at 100%, Optical zoom, that's all the bigger it is. So let's zoom in some on our digital zoom. You can see why Stephen James O'Meara was saying it's just a modeled core with a 4 inch. But with an 11 inch, we can resolve several stars in that core, can't we? Boy, that's a tiny globular cluster. It's going to be such a small target in the full picture. 6287. 6287. NGC 6287 at uh, two minutes. Eight frames, twenty twenty two zero eight seventeen. Save a scene sixty two eighty seven. <coughs> Excuse me, sixty two eighty seven, sixty two eighty seven, sixty two eighty seven. Remove from the working list. Save. Yeah, I'm glad we caught this. I think that's another reason to do the O'Meara book because, you know, we were at objects way high in the sky and we were about to lose this one. So I'm glad we caught it. 
Uh, Stephen James Romero next says to go to 62.35. Yeah, and it's also not been observed. Let's see. It's at 17 degrees above the horizon. Sorry, 18. 62.35. So let's go back here and change this to next target and 62. It's probably in the same frame, don't you think? 62.35 slew there. So about 62.87, let's just say teeny tiny globular um, resolved in 11 inch something like that. And then about 6235 is another globular. And it's going to be right here in the center again. So let's switch to start imaging. Dawn, it's so cute. Tiny is probably large in space, huh? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, let's see if... Mm-hmm. 6287. NGC 6287. NGC 6287 wiki. It's a distance of 30,000 light years. And apparent dimension is 4.8 arc minutes wide. I actually do have a little calculator that helps you figure out what would be the distance, what would be the size of it. But typically it's faster just to Google it. <laughs> um, 4.8 arc minutes at 30,300 light years. I don't know whether I'll be able to find that program or not. I think it's called How Big hmm. What was that program called? I picked up a little <clears throat> I picked up a little program. Maybe I left it on my desktop. Um, man, you know, I haven't used it very much. Yeah. How big is a light year? No, that isn't it. <laughs> so maybe I'm remembering incorrectly, but I, I picked up a little program, Astro Size. Maybe this is it. Yeah, this is it. So, how do we get rid of this now? Uh, please confirm you want to close. Okay, so distance to object is 30,000 light years. 30,300 light years. <clears throat> the angle subtended by the object was 4.8 arc minutes. 4 point, oh it doesn't allow us to do decimals. So let's go 4 arc minutes and then what would point 8 be? That would be about 45 arc seconds. Four minutes, 
45 arc seconds units light years calculate 42 light years wide so it's a nice little calculator and it's called astro size so you put in the distance put in the units put in the arc minutes click calculate and it tells you how wide the object is so back to your question Jen this object is 42 light years wide and to put that in perspective um, yeah not sinking beyond behind the trees little by little but to put that in perspective 42 light years wide here um, it's eight light minutes to the Sun it's four light years to the nearest star 42 light years is big huge anyway so there you go did we already switch the sequencer to the next target mode now let's go back to here and I think we already did um, where everything got minimized now to the 6287 uh, 6287 I think we already did all these didn't we yeah we did okay so that's sinking behind the trees pretty interesting thank you Jen the autolites and GPS land surveyor Stu oh Stu is a land surveyor that's cool um, it works in meters not light years Jen's dad was a civil engineer. Stu, we work in degrees, minutes, and seconds, too. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to mark uh, 6235 as observed in the Stephen James O'Meara book. Now, I think that means we're finished. Let's go back and review here. Looking in July, from the start of July, Oh, 5846, I don't think we have. 58, 5846, yes, we do. 5846 is observed. And then what about 5322? 5322, yes, observed. Um, 5474, 5474, yes, observed. Um, 5631, 5631, observed. 5676, 5689, and then we did all four of those, both of those, all four of those, both of those, all three of those, which brings us to 6293. 6293 observed. 6355. That's where we are. We're caught up to 6355. So let's slew there and center on it and show info for it. Compact globular. I'm just realizing we hadn't done a little observation on 6235 yet. 6355 is another globular and it's in uh, Ophiuchus. 6355, 6355, globular cluster in Ophiuchus, 63, NGC 6355, 
Boy, you can already see it right there in the middle, can't you? Look right there. We're going to have to live stack to see it, though. Uh, there we go. Jen says, too much math for me. Stu, I remember doing trig in school thinking, I'll never use this. What a waste of time. <laughs> and then you became a surveyor. Jen, laugh out loud. You should have seen Dad tutoring me through math in high school and college. Oh, my. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, that's a nice little globular. And it was visible right off the bat, wasn't it? Look at that. That's beautiful. And look at all that rich field of stars behind it. 63.55. It's just 17 degrees above the horizon, so we're going to be into the trees here soon, too, I bet. So Stephen James Amiro says about 63.55. It's a modestly bright but obvious lobular cluster, uh, best seen at moderate ma magnifications. Looks like a moderately small two arc minutes and compact glow with a bright though diffuse center. Mm -hmm. At 72 power, it's a pale comet-like glow that gradually gets brighter toward the center, but not to a nucleus. <laughs> the inner region remains a compact, uniform glow. No stars can be resolved. See with our 11-inch we can. Its horizontal branch magnitude is 17.2. Horizontal branch magnitude. That must be this little core here. 17.2 magnitude. Boy, we're picking it up well, aren't we, in the 11-inch rasa. It is pretty, Jen. You're right. It's got an orangish glow. I don't know if that's because it's down there in that. But look at all of those background stars, so many of them. Beautiful. It's hard to tell where the I guess this is just the tightest part of the globular, and these are just foreground stars, I guess. So let's do this like this, and include just a couple of those foreground stars, just for maybe like that, just for perspective. This is 6355. NGC. NGC 6355 with just two minutes, seven frames on 202817. And then we'll save a scene. Isn't that something? This little globular cluster flying through the night sky together, probably. 8 billion years old or something. Um, so that's all she wrote about 63.55. And then 63.16 is supposed to be nearby. 63.55. Add to the Herschel Form Reserve list. 6355. 6355. Remove working list. Save. Switch to next target. Okay, and then the other one was nearby was 6316. Yep, sure enough, there it is. 6316. So let's slew there and center on it and open up the little info pane. Oh, we have to do this. Uh, hmm, we lost our observing session. I don't know why. It's not good. I wonder why we did. Um, tiny core resolved 
an uh, 11 inch scope. 6316, another cogular. And it's in Ophiuchus also. 6316. 6316. The hope is that after you do this enough, that you'll develop this as kind of a muscle memory. Yeah, there it is, right there in the middle. Um, you want this to all kind of be automatic, don't you? I mean, you want to just kind of have this, this, like playing a piano becomes, you know, you, you want to play those scales so many times that you really don't think about them anymore. And for that to happen, I figure it just has to happen hundreds of times for this to all be automatic. Look at that. I wonder if we're, oh, here our background. It's because we're down in that Louisville light pollution. Probably close to the trees as well. But there it is. Looks like a, almost looks like a distant sun, doesn't it? Just almost doesn't resolve. This is 6316. Uh, it's a small, reasonably obvious globular cluster about one and a half degrees south, southeast of fourth magnitude, 36 Ophiuchi. It is slightly condensed as best seen with averted vision. Uh, at 23 power in a four inch, it's a small and somewhat condensed glow. About two arc minutes in diameter, it lies just northeast of an 11th magnitude sun, which seen together makes the cluster appear elongated at a glance. Uh, at 72 power, the cluster is simply a round glow with a slightly brighter middle. It is not resolved. The cluster's brightest stars shine at 15th magnitude. So that's 6316. So then we'll come over here and we'll say this one was tougher to resolve. Would you guys say that's resolving at all? I mean, maybe we can see four stars around the outside and digital zoom at 359%. <laughs> this is the end of 100% of our camera's optical view. And it's not, that core does not resolve. Adjust colors, okay, let's try that. Thank you very much, Stu. Reduce that background glow a little. That's just, I think, picking up the, the Louisville light pollution, maybe. Surely it's not orange on its own. Might be, but that's a lot of orange, isn't it? Definitely looked orange on our horizon next to the light dome of Louisville. I think that's just the light dome that's doing that. If you look here in our uh, planetarium software, that's southwest. And Louisville is directly, actually Louisville is northwest. So maybe this is all of this Milky Way that's causing it to be orange. Because Louisville would be way over here. Hmm. I think that might be somewhat of the Milky Way orange stars. Let's back off and look at the whole scene. Hmm. I think we're picking up a little bit. That could be uh, E-Town or... It's a neat little globular cluster though, isn't it? 
too much orange juice to us. We can manually bring it down. How about that? Is that better? You might be right. Maybe that's truer to the eye. Appreciate your inputs too. Okay, and then he says go to 6304. Let's look at that. Yeah, we haven't looked at that yet either. 6304. And let's remember to take this off of live stacking. 6304. Center on it. Show the input thing. Another globular cluster. And it's in the same spot. This one is in uh, also in Ophiuchus. And right there it is. So let's start imaging. Stephen James O'Meara says about 6316s, the small and reasonably obvious, whoops, 6304, sorry. He says it's uh, moderately small and faint, globular cluster a little less than one and a half degrees south of 6316 uh, in a small telescope is best seen under dark sky at moderate mild unification. 23 power, moderately faint, two arc minute glow with some central condensation visible. It's better seen at 72 power, Dramatically elongated. Yeah, we can see that, can't we? In a roughly east-west direction, surrounded by an irregular halo. Core also sparkles a bit with averted vision. So there you go. 6304. 6304. 6, So let's um, do another color balance here real quick and bring the sky glow down and these mids up a little bit. Boy, that's on fire, isn't it? And that looks like we, we've got to keep it that way in order to even see it. 6304. Three oh four. Not sure why this one looks so on fire. It could also be the position we are in the night sky, you think? I guess maybe it's maybe there's a light dome over in that part of the sky from E Town. And it's picking that up. Either way, this is a much more interesting globular cluster, isn't it? I just start an entry here. Super interesting. That's delete. Super interesting. Looked on fire to us in our scope tonight. Maybe that was the glow of E Town. Uh, Adrian, good to have you aboard. Jen, thanks for being the miscongeniality there and welcoming people. Appreciate that. Um, 6304, is that what we're looking at? Yeah, 6304. 'Cause it's a very nice site. No wait, sorry. 
Oh, that's the one we already... 6304? Yeah. Dramatically elongated. Sparkles a bit with averted vision. Yeah, it looks like it's on fire. This is interesting. I'm going to do a um, screenshot of this one too because I think this one's also going to be very tiny in that frame. We're going to say um, desktop shortcut NGC 6304 at three minutes. Um, and it's 12 frames on 2022-08-17. Okay. Next target. APN, VPN permit. Andrian. I don't know what that means. Um, the next target Stephen James O'Meara pushes us to is um, 6451. Let's see if we've observed that one yet. 64, we have. 6451 is already observed. 6451. So that brings us to 6207. 6207 is already observed, right? 6207, yes. And then 6229 already observed. And then 6217 already observed. Those are interesting. And that brings us to August. So we finished July now, <laughs> a little bit behind. Now in August, we were supposed to go look at 6118. There we go, 6118. to it. This is a spiral galaxy. And serpents kaput, the snake's head. 6118. This is title NGC 6118, a <clears throat> spiral galaxy in serpents kaput. View. And we better do a quick little plate solve here because I'm not seeing a spiral galaxy. Let's see if we were off some. Maybe it's just that dim. We were off. 0.24 degrees. Not too much, but now we'll um, <clears throat> we'll hopefully see it right in the middle of the frame now. Still not visible. Okay, so let's do our imaging run and start live stacking. Sixty 
Hmm, still not visible. That's a bad sign, huh? Does anybody else see this? It should be right in the middle of the frame. Let's use the... Down there it says. It's weird, isn't it? Why would it be down there? Boy, I am not seeing it yet. Let's read about it here. An extremely dim and difficult galaxy for a small telescope, even under a dark sky, it is about two and a fourth degrees northeast of third magnitude delta Ophiuchi, near a 6.5 magnitude star. Patience and time is required to see the galaxy in a small telescope. It's one of the most difficult objects in the Herschel 400 list. Plan on spending some time confirming your sighting of it. Stephen James O'Meara, I'm a believer. Uh, it's not visible in the 4 inch at 23 power. It is a most difficult object at 72 power. A vision, a dark sky, and lots of time breathing rhythmically and lightly tapping the telescope tube to set the object in motion will help to bring it out. Look for a slightly round core with dim extensions to the south, west, and northeast. A roughly 12th magnitude star lies a few arc minutes to its south, southwest. Boy. <laughs> Jim. Jim's laughing. I don't see this. I don't see this at all. It looks like there's a pattern of three stars and then two stars. Let me show you a picture of this. This is what we're looking for. A spiral galaxy like that. And see how it has a pattern of three stars on one side and two stars on the other. There, down below it, there are four stars and a little arc. And the fourth star is a double. So let's look for that little arc of four. And look how right next to it is a funny little, I don't know what you'd call it, an offsetted line of one, two, three, and then two. And then there's a triangle. So we got an arc of four, an offset line, and then a little obtuse whatever triangle, and then the galaxy. Okay, let's. Let's try to find this baby. Boy, can you believe this? It's still not visible. it down there we I think the deep sky image annotation tool is off surely it wouldn't be down there boy wherever it is it's dim isn't it If it's starting to come in right there. Maybe starting to appear there. 
Remember how we were supposed to look for, <coughs> what was it? Do a plate solve only to make sure annotation is dead on. Hi, Mike. It's a good idea. Mike's saying plate solve only so we don't mess up our Plate solve only. I wonder if that's it starting to appear right there. It definitely must be difficult because Stephen James O'Meara can see everything through his four inch telescope. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Okay, so now it's plate solved. Yeah, that's exactly where I was asking. I was just saying, is that where it's coming in? Wow, it's so faint. Look at that. It's just ghostly. You almost have to have, there, you can bring it up if you make this guy dark, but then it looks mottled. You almost have to have the sky glow up a little bit more than usual. And then, bring this up, and it's right there coming in. Let's look and see where we're looking in the night sky here. So it's southwest, between southwest and west. It's not a particularly terrible sky glow part of the sky for us. Let's go to our, um, well, there is a lot of sky glow there, isn't it? That's the live view through the mono camera. Hmm. Quite a lot of sky glow down there. That must be something new, E-Town or something. And that sky glow is making it difficult. Wow. Ruined my, hasn't it? It's ruined the southern and southwestern horizon, all that glow from E-Town or whatever that, Elizabethtown, whatever that is. Sadness. Mike's asking what filter we're using. It's still that same one, the Celestron light pollution filter. It's the only thing that lets us see anything in this Louisville light pollution. How about that? Boy, you know, now you can sort of imagine it there if you have a good imagination. The moon rose already, and I think it's over here to the left somewhere. Um, so we are getting moonlight. Let's look at clear outside. It's a 57% moon that rose at 11.50. So that is another factor, Stu. Good, good thought. Jen, yeah, I like those ink blots.
That's nine minutes. Wow. It's just so faint. But you can pick out the core at least. Steve O'Meara says it's See, it's 6118, isn't it? Let's go back to the 6118. Extremely dim and difficult. It is one of the most difficult objects on the entire Herschel 400 list. Plan on spending some time. Not visible in the 4 inch at 23 power. Most difficult in the 72 power. You have to tap the telescope tube. Hmm. To put things in perspective, this star is apparently 12th magnitude. Give it a little more time, Stu says. Jen says, give it a little more imagination. <laughs> yeah, the problem with it is that um, we are also exacerbated by the moon tonight. The sky glow. Hmm. You can definitely see there's something there, can't you? But it's definitely faint. If you run the block level down to there, try to bring the mids up you get this little modeled view of the core. See that? Almost looks like it's a x-ray pattern. <laughs> so if you bring up the sky glow a little and back off the mids, We're at 300% digital zoom here. So it's also a tiny object. I believe that Celestron filter blocks IR, which really hurts galaxy imaging. It might. I, I'd have to go back and read the spec sheet again. I haven't looked at it lately. 20-second um, images. Azray. Helps to have the sky glow there a little bit. Hmm. I'm going to go ahead and take a snapshot of that, such as it is. We're going to call that um, NGC 6118, 13 minutes, 40 frames. If you squint, you can see it. <laughs> You're right. Boy, it is a challenging object, isn't it? Well, it's 1225. Let's do one more thing. Uh, let's go ahead and end this. That was definitely a great object to challenge us, wasn't it? Let's go back here and, by the way, did we? 6118. Add to observing list. 
We're going to count that as observed, even though it, that you use your imagination a little bit. But we're going to count it as observed. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to write here, Steve, um, Steve O'Meara said this was one of the toughest objects on the Herschel 400 list. We are now believers. We could barely imagine it being there, but sky glow and the moon washed it out for sure. Let's go um, look at the moon real quick, just real quick. Fifty nine point fifty nine per cent tonight. <clears throat> Stu, the hardest object on the Herschel list deserves twenty minutes at least. Is Uranus visible yet? It blocks everything over seven hundred nanometers, so IR is blocked. Okay, thanks, Mike, for verifying. Bob says yes, it's there. Cool. Uh, as Ray, I was watching Tiago. Keep it simple. He uses a gain of three fifty with his ZW two ninety four camera. Seems to work for him. Yeah, I use a gain of 100 just to get those 14 dynamic uh, f-stops, and that usually works on everything, but I guess every camera's a little different, huh? Boy, the moon. Oh, I see it's just barely above the horizon, apparently. Hmm. It's down here near the, near the base of the horizon. Let's go ahead and look in the sky glow, though, um, the sky cam. Yeah, you can see the moon glow behind those trees, can't you? And then in our... In our actual um, there's the moon in our ASI 2600 MC Pro kind of peeking out from behind the trees. So again here's the sky cam. It's the moonrise. And then um, let's go back to the screen and let's see um, Uranus. It is below the horizon even more. And Mars. also below the horizon. Yeah, those have not risen enough to see yet with our horizon, but they're very close. As you can see, um, we'll have to catch the moon with those planets um, another night. Well, that's the end. It's uh, there's the moon. <laughs> it's uh, twelve thirty. That brings our our broadcast to an end. Thanks to everybody who was there. Um, be a while longer until it's up high enough to see. Yeah. Oh well. Saturn's coming up. Yeah. Same thing with Saturn. I think. Saturn. 
center on Saturn. Oh, it's a little better. Yeah, Saturn's fine. to Saturn. Um, you know, there's the scope making its way over there. Don, I'm polishing some of my opals. Thanks for the stream, Doug. <laughs> uh, thank you, Stu, and thank you, Mike. You guys are uh, all awesome encouragers, and thanks to everybody who's been on tonight. Uh, we've had a good dozen or so plus the whole evening long making our way through this Herschel list uh, and we'll keep on uh, there Saturn uh, it's a great night to be able to um, see the moons of Saturn and then we'll get down to like um, what point one what did we do the other night? Was it one millisecond to be able to see some separation? Was that with 100 gain? I forget. And then we stacked. Or no, maybe we didn't stack. Maybe it was with 400 gain. And tonight, maybe it's going to be two, mil two milliseconds. Yeah. So you can see it kind of boiling. That's 200%. Whoops, let me get back on the screen. So that's trying to boil just the planet. And uh, the Rasa does a little better at the moons. At one second, I think, you can start to make out all those moons and <clears throat> see. Um, so, for instance, tonight we should have see Lepetus and then Titan and Hyperion are double, so... Trying to make them out here. Those are in an arc, and there are two there, so let's see what that would be. Um, here's a nice arc. So that could be Helena, Dion, and Enceladus. And this could be the double, maybe. Tethys. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that is Helena. Helena Dion. So that's Helena Dion. And then here's the double of. Um, and the latest and Tethys, and then look at the way you can see um, a moon there and a moon there, and that would be maybe Calypso on one end and. Maybe these two, Pan and Atlas here. Here's Telesto here. But you can definitely see those moons closer to the planet. So the Rasa does a little better job on the moons, but not so great at the planet itself. Jen, thanks for being here. Riley, appreciate you checking in. 
Um, Azray, thanks for being here. Mike, all of you guys, we appreciate you. Uh, thanks for being a part of this and for uh, the challenging objects in that Herschel list, too. Uh, we'll be back on another clear night, maybe Friday night if it's clear again. And we'll look forward to seeing you then on another evening at Emerald Hill Skies. Thanks to God for making all these cool objects for us to see. See you later. Have a good evening. God bless. Good night.